Welcome to our lecture online. Now let's take a closer look at Kepler's third law. And in the case where the mass of the sun or the mass of the star is much larger than the mass of the planet. Now if that's the case, we know that the barycenter, which is the center mass of the star planet system, is very close to the center of the star in such a way that you probably will not be able to measure the movement of the star using spectroscopy, moving the recession and, and the approaching velocities of the star as the star moves around the barycenter. If the barycenter is really close to the center of the star, you will not be able to detect that. But Kepler did discover that there's a relationship between the period and the average distance between the planet and the star, also known as the semi-major axis, and we knew that there was a constant that related those two to one another, where p squared is equal to a constant times a cubed. Now that constant now has been determined to be 4 pi squared divided by g and divided by the mass of the star. How did we determine that? Well, when we start out by the concept that, of course, this is the distance between the planet and the star, let's call that the radius of the orbit, we can say that the force of gravity as calculated by Newton, is equal to the centripetal force of its motion. The force of gravity would be g times the product of the two masses divided by the distance between them squared, and the centripetal force will be equal to, of course on the small mass, that will be mv squared over r. So what we're going to do first is calculate v from this equation in terms of the other variables. First, the mass cancels out of the planet, and then one of the r's here cancels out. So that means that we have v squared is equal to g m over r, or v is equal to the square root of g m over r. Now the next thing we're going to do is take a look at the orbit of the, of the planet and relate that to how, how long would it take. Well, we have the equation that distance equals velocity times time, and that means that time is equal to distance divided by velocity. And of course, in this case, when we have the planet, the time for one particular orbit would be the period. So the period is equal to the distance, which is 2 pi times the radius, divided by the velocity. Now, of course, we're assuming that the orbit is very nearly circular, and so we can use this as an approximation to that. Now, the period equals 2 pi r, what if we square both sides of the equation because we actually have an equation that tells us what v squared is in terms of g, the mass of the sun, and the distance to the sun. So let's go ahead and do that. We square both sides. We get the period squared is equal to 4 pi squared r squared divided by v squared. And since v squared is equal to gm over r, we can plug that in here. We can then say that the period is equal to 4 pi squared r squared divided by, instead of v squared, we're going to write gm over r, gm over r, and of course this r can then move to the numerator, so we get the period is equal to 4 pi squared r cubed divided by gm. Now let's go over here. Now we realize that p squared is equal to 4 pi squared over gm times a cubed, and let's see here, I think I dropped my period squared. Can't do that, otherwise things won't work out. Okay, there we go. And so now, of course, this p is the same as this t here. That's the period of the orbit. In other words, we can replace this by 4 pi squared r cubed over gm, or what I can do is, I can write this as follows. I can say that p squared is equal to, let's write that, 4 pi squared r cubed divided by g and m. And notice that this constant here is exactly the same as what I had over there, and instead of a, I have an r cubed, but that's essentially the same thing. r was the average distance between the planet and the sun. So in other words, Kepler's law comes to the same equation that p squared times this constant, 4 pi squared over gm, times a cubed is what he found it to be. Now, of course, he knew this was a constant. He could calculate what the constant was numerically based upon measuring the, the um, period and measuring the average distance, but he didn't know where that came from. 
now that we had Newton's laws of motion and we had the understanding of centripetal force, when we put that together, we can clearly see that that constant that Kepler realized was there is actually equal to that. And that's how it's done.